Yesterday we witnessed an amazing game in Z played between Wei Yi, always attractive and full of crazy attractive ideas, like in like from the era of Kasparov, and Max Varverdom from the Netherlands. They played my favorite bishops opening. You know that two two years ago in Chasuble I published the course Butcher E5 with the bishops opening, and it's not some they played something that it wasn't something like completely new for me i was familiar with that but simply i didn't have like enough braveness to give you that in the course because i thought it's complicated or it's full of crazy lines and not with uh, you know like definite advantage but let me just show you what happened in that game it's spectacular game one of the most one of the craziest games uh, uh, so far and let's check it out. Ve was white, he played e4, Varverdam played e5, bishop c4, and Ve played mat f6. Sorry, Varverdam played uh, mat f6. After d3, it's called bulletproof approach in my course, bishop c5. Uh, that's an early bishop c5 when black doesn't commit himself with an early knight c6. And here, of course, we played knight c3. Uh, the point of this move is to uh, fight against d5 and c6. And then you have, in my additional part of the course uh, that, that I made, play bishop b3 to give you a safe, solid advantage, which is fighting against d5 with a tempo, or play queen f3 that fights against d5 and gives white quite a nice an easy game. Although in the game, Wei Yi went for f4. And that's what I told you. I had this analysis. Uh, I was absolutely familiar with this one. But I said, okay, I guess you probably should try this out in some blitz or rapid experience. And look what happened here. So after like f4, uh, Varmerdam played d5. Very logical move. He reacts in the center, breaks there white takes the point is that you cannot take on d5 which would be the most logical thing because of bishop b5 and f takes e5 with tempo uh, the, the point was he went for knight g4 uh, same thing can happen if castle you take on e5 knight g4 they threaten that famous knight f2 idea and it's not the end of the world you just play knight f3 and transpose uh, into the game and into the position that happened in this game so after he takes d5, this guy played knight g4 with extremely, extremely dangerous looking position for us. And you know, when I make course, uh, I always have to keep in mind that not only good players rate those courses and buy those courses, but also guys who have lots of problems to allow something like this, bishop on c5, knight on g4, and now you even have to uh, tell them, hey, cold bloodedly, just give up the rook on h1 and continue with your initiative. It's not easy. But anyways, uh, Wei Yi played knight f3. I'm so happy that this game happened and it just shows you how good bishop's opening uh, is. And after castles, he went for f takes e5. Now he's having two pawns. Uh, he's actually up two pawns, but this guy went for knight f2. Queen e2 and won the rook. So uh, we have two pawns and a strong center and definitely great development, but they have rook. So everyone, I say, should be happy with existing type of the game. After bishop g5, uh, Varmerdam played queen a5, d6. And just like I told you, uh, this wasn't something uh, that I wasn't uh, familiar with. Uh, it happened in correspondence games in the past. And in one of those games was bishop to a3. Something similar happened in this game. And black played bishop g4 in this case. By the way, uh, something similar with the bishop a3 you're going to see in the game and you should be uh, solving the problems uh, that happen, you know, like after bishop a3, 11th move, almost in the same fashion like from the game. So you'll see what I'm, what I'm talking about. But Merdan played bishop g4, which is a very logical developing move. He just wants knight d7 and play rook e8. Way he plays bishop e7, and in a way, he's not only attacking an exchange, he's also blocking any kind of actions uh, on the e file and the x rays that black can take and can make after uh, placing his rook on e8. 
after bishop e7 uh, the game i was referring to was bishop a3 here bishop f8 bishop b2 and e6 and it's complete craziness on the board that we're getting here in that game was bishop c3 king f1 bishop e6 bishop e6 and please tell me how can i give you this in the course i mean even i don't understand what's happening on the board not to mention yourself by the way this game ended up like check check bishop g7 and after bishop g7 he uh, keep on giving perpetual check and date for the game in this game instead of bishop a3 that Varmerden probably had to play in this position he came up with a logical novelty and this is the point why I once again have to get back to the uh, similar type of uh, style and fashion that Kasparov used to use so like you just have to play ideally good and uh, play all these crazy accurate moves in order to equalize or to get some some draw and what kind of risk do you take you take first of all here you're up a rook for two pawns but you're uh, definitely behind in development white has a great initiative position is full of tactics and imagine i mean if way he played a game i'm pretty sure he analyzed this uh, a lot more and way deeper uh, than we we can even imagine so after 97 he just went for e6 breaks in the center you can't take because bishop takes bishop takes queen takes and eventually knight on d7 is gonna die rook is hanging knight is trapped on h1 so uh, varmerdam played bishop a3 very logical move uh, it's a logical thing because he threatens on b2 you can't take because of uh, queen c3 so looks like a difficult moment he takes f7 and king h8 and here way he practically played the only move in order to for example practice your calculating skills and your defensive skills take a look at this position for example put it on the board pause the video and ask yourself what would you play so i usually give you tactical uh, questions and the tasks and here this is defensive task for you after long castle they just take on c3 whoever played long castle and allowed uh, queen takes c3 and uh, to take on a3 you guys made a great point and when i spoke to my student matt he just told me maya this is a very interesting line uh, great uh, addition would be for the course uh, john told me that as well so th thank you my, my my students and thank you very much for uh, urgent information that the bishop's opening uh, took its part in vikanza on such a high level and here um there is this was the only moment of the game where black could do something and black's move is hyper illogical i mean it's a5 you gotta play a5 to play b5 to afterwards do something in order to get like a position with mutual chances uh i would highly uh disagree with this approach from black's point of view you have to know everything uh, then everything depends on memorization uh, or crazy calculating skills and just like you see Varmerdam who's like 26 25 player he couldn't cope with this position uh, got out calculated and easily lost the game he took on f3 g takes f3 played knight e5 um, after like king b1 placing that king into safety uh, knight on h1 don't even consider that knight uh, as a piece that exists in the game sooner or later you're gonna pick it up from another point of view uh, if he just captured on c4 uh, you're just going to recapture and there is no power to stop the pawn pushing and that's why uh, Varmerdam played queen d4 and at the same time probably he was hoping for some uh, queen f2 uh, so, or more likely knight f2 in some positions uh, so after like rook h1 he took on c4 d takes c4 and to be honest with you i'd be pretty much uh, confused about the quality of this position uh, yes we do have it more than enough compensation uh, two four five seven eight pawns against five pawns f7 is hanging 
uh, other pawns are not better either but if rook f7 he would just play rook d1 uh, confusion for example for myself and in my thoughts to go into this line would be this move because it goes along with check but after you play king c1 you just realize they can't stop d7 and d8 the, the point was that after d takes c4, queen b6, king c1, he captured the pawn. So they once again entered that position. And after rook to d1, where he supports the d6 pawn and wants to push it all the way to d8, rook f to f8, pushed the d7, played queen e5, played... Uh, why rook d8? Because in some moments, uh, of course, he can promote, but he can also play this move which is also very likely uh, a, a nice tactics. After rook a to d8, played f4, played bishop d8, cannot play rook to d8 because of queen e8, and after queen d8, took on c5, and this guy resigned the game. Once again, when you look at this position and uh, the degree of craziness in the game, you're down a rook, you have two pawns, those two pawns are in the center, you have these uh, two crazy bishops, all these minor pieces that you have to count on the possibilities by your opponent cope with bishop a3, where your knight on c3 might be hanging. You just realize uh, how brave, uh, but at the same time, how well prepared, or just how ready you have to be in order to calculate like crazy in the game like this. So even if you decide to play like this, don't go into this if it's not your day, if you're not ready to calculate like crazy, and simply if you're not good with the calculating skills. But if you decide to play this, consider getting my chessable course, Butcher E5 with the bishops opening. Thanks for watching and hope that you enjoyed in this short analysis. Bye bye.